welcome everyone to the September 2023 update. Got lots to cover. Um, and there's going to be a lot of information that you've heard before. We might say it in a slightly different way, uh, but we will get through a lot of information. A lot of a lot of new information since the last time we spoke too. So let's uh, let's get straight uh, to it. Um, so, just to give you a recap of where we are as of now. Now we talked about the seasonality of the markets last time we spoke, and we talked about. Uh, the markets tend to have a good first quarter in the third year of a presidential cycle, but then they tend to hiccup in September, October, which is where we are. So we now have year-to-date Dow Jones, which is the 30 stocks, 0.8% uh, for the year. The Toronto Stock Exchange Decimal 1. The S&P, we talked about this last time, 10.8, but it's being driven largely by the NASDAQ, which is 24 I also put S&P equal weight. So you have all 500 stocks, but you have one 500th in each one. You're actually minus 0.4. So you're losing money, even though you own the same 500 stocks. Disaster year again for the bond market. Good news is we have no bonds uh, other than short term, just to hold cash. But the bond market, uh, two measures here, the BMO, um, uh, ETF, which is the aggregate bond. So it's all the bonds, large bonds in Canada grouped into one minus 4.9 and the federal long bond index minus 10.7 gold plus two oil plus 16. And I will add that the Canadian dollar is minus uh, is, uh, plus 0.5. So actually, if you take out the, if you own the Dow 30, you're really only up decimal three. What we're going to cover today, what is driving the bus? Now, even has changed since we spoke last. The bond market, why this is so important. We own no bonds, so why am I stressing about this? U.S. and Canadian stock markets, where can we find places to invest? We talk about a soft recession in the U.S. This is what we've been talking about all year long. Remember the start of the year? We were going to have a severe recession. The yield curve was telling us, and we said, we'll hold it. Uh, that's uh, not what the data we were seeing so far. Uh, we are we've had no recession, but we're still calling for some kind of a soft slowdown. Yield curve to normalize in 2024. We'll get more detailed on that. Preferred share, as I say, do the math. We're going to do a little bit of math here. Hard recession in Canada, different outcome than the United States, and how to protect yourself for what's coming in Canada. So let's let's get to it. A little quote here. I used to think if there was reincarnation, I want to come back as the bond market. James Carville, economic strategist to Bill Clinton. Now, why was this appropriate at the time? Because bonds were so important and they were wreaking havoc in the economy. So we're going to go through what's kind of similar to today. Latest headline since we spoke last, U.S. Fed held rates. They did not raise them at the last meeting, but they did signal one more rate hike this year. Um, as a result, the three-year chart of the five-year bonds. Now, I looked at our chart last time. We've gone from two times ago, it was about three and a half. We've gone 3.9 in the last chart, and we're 428. And in fact, this was... Printed two days ago, it's even higher today. So yields have gone from just above zero on a bond to above four, 428. So what does this mean? Well, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of math here. Just to give you an example for people that aren't quite get their heads around how a price of a bond, this is math. So one year ago, bottom left-hand corner, the coupon rate, that is the rate that the bond was issued at. Okay, so a year ago, you've been rolling GICs, you've been saying, wow, I've been sitting here for so long at 0%, and then 2019 rates finally clicked up to one and a half, and then they went back down again in COVID. I'm gonna take advantage of two and three quarters, and you bought a bond, maturing the 1st of June, 2033. Well, if you went to sell that bond today, you would get a price of 
and 30, well, that's 89 cents on the dollar, okay? Um, and the math is that the 10-year government of bond yields 409 today. So that's just math. If you plug in a different interest rates, if rates are higher than your rate, so someone who's buying that for $89,000 is only going to make two and three quarters, but their 89,000 is going to mature at 100,000. The combination of that $11,000 gain and two and three quarters is exactly 409. That's the pricing mechanism. So if someone says, I'm going to sell this bond, I, I, I'm not happy with my two and three quarters, I'm going to sell it and buy another bond at you know 409. You didn't do yourself any favors. You just need the broker some money for a transaction because you're only getting 88,000. So your 88,000 reinvested at 4% is going to yield exactly the same. This is the pricing mechanism of the bond market. Put another way, um, if you bought the ZFL, which is the most liquid federal exchange traded fund, you paid $21 in 2020 and it's worth 11 and change today. You've almost lost half your money. This is how risky bonds can be. As a former guy that got my teeth wet in the bond trading desks, it's incredible to me that the banks, and you know why we left the bank, the bank said, oh, you're, our clients are medium risk. We don't speculate, but we take some risk. They would say, you must have 40%, 60-40, you must have 40% in the bond market. Well, thank goodness I left that firm. And by the way, all banks do this to their clients. They send out quarterly reports. Your client doesn't have enough bonds. It's incredible you know, that you would put something. If you overpay for a low-risk asset, that low-risk asset becomes a risky asset. So rates rose. The good news is we have no exposure there. We haven't. Now, last time we spoke, we talked about supply and demand. Now, I'm not going to put a supply and demand curve from Economics 101, we'll talk conceptually. Treasury yields hits highest since 2007 after US debt hits a record $33 trillion. Now, supply and demand, I mentioned this before. If you told me there's gonna be a flood of new lumber hitting the market, I'm gonna tell you that I think lumber prices will go down, supply and demand. If you're gonna tell me that we're gonna issue a lot of new bonds, now, this is what's really troubling, not the total size, but in the last quarter, one quarter, U.S. Treasury boosts quarterly borrowing estimate to $1 trillion. You know, I try not to be political, although I, I always am. The timing of the inf Joe Biden's Inflation Recovery Act, and their hearts were in the right places because this was dreamed up in 2020, the COVID. We're going to spend money. This is the old Keynesian economics. We're going to spend money and get the economy going. Well, now the problem is we have a booming economy. We have full employment. So this is not the time to run a deficit. But at the end of the day, when you run a deficit, you have to borrow. If you're borrowing money from someone, it's issuing a brand new bond. Well, guess who are the buyers of the bonds? There tend to be people that already own bonds. So they sell their bonds to buy the new one. And you get into a cycle of lower prices because people are selling the bonds to buy the new bonds. It's, a, it's actually a downward spiral that was I was getting out of that under the uh, Trudeau, Pierre, and Carter administration that I was dealing with in the bond areas. But but there is a silver lining, and the silver lining is that we're finally getting some fixed income assets because of higher rates that we can buy. I mean, this is so exciting because it has been 15 years since I've been able to recommend a bond. U.S. 10-year tips, 2.23. This is an inflation-adjusted product. 
So the U.S. Fed, whatever inflation is, if it's two, they'll give you 4.23, 4 2 point plus whatever inflation is. If inflation is four, they'll give you 6.23. I'll just give you a bit of history because you know we're students of history here. The historical rate of return since 1900 of the U.S. government of bonds versus inflation is 1.4%. The industrialized world is actually decimal seven. So 2.23 is not bad. It's safe. It's a bargain. We have been dealing with, with 15 years of real yields between minus one to minus two. So that's something you can put in your portfolio, and it's exciting that we can have an alternative that is guaranteed by the U.S. Federal Reserve. We're going to talk in a, in a little bit about the election cycle, but highly probable that they actually do cut rates uh, next year. We're going to talk about that in a moment, and this product will probably go up in value. Um, all right. So. U.S. Fed comes out and they say, we're not going to raise rates, but we're going to raise one more time. The big change, and this is what got the market spooked, they signaled that they have no intent on cutting rates. Now, the market's been saying, well, if you remember in the spring, the U.S. Fed's going to cut rates by one and a quarter percent this year. Well, now the Fed's saying, no, no, we're actually going to raise more. Um, so this is a this is a market that is spooked by the U.S. Federal Reserve that has said we are not raising rates until probably late 2025. Now, what's bugging the Fed? UPS CEO drivers will average 170,000 in pay and benefits at the end of five years. 170,000. These are in real dollars. These aren't in yen or Australian dollars. This is U.S. dollars for a truck driver. So the problem, I'm going to give you a little issue here, and that is, you know, economists tend to say all things being equal. So I'll take a liberty here. Imagine a town, there's a thousand people in it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's its own country. They have their own currency. And in this town, everybody makes $100,000 a year. And the you know, people come out and say, you know, we need some more money. And and you give them yeah, 20,000 raise and everyone's making 120. Well, guess what happens in your town? The price of butter goes up, the price of cars goes up, and everything goes up 20% because products and services are the function of supply and demand. There's a little window there where, honey, we got some more money, let's go for dinner. And you go for dinner and the restaurant's full and and the guy who owns the restaurant says, hey, you, you, we're full here. I'm going to raise my price a little bit. Boy, business is good. I, I think we'll still be full. You get into this cycle. So you pay everyone $120,000, then the price goes up. Now, if, you, if everyone in this town then says, well, hey, we need another $20,000 because everything went up 20%, you're into a price and wage spiral that we haven't seen. So this is what is bugging Jerome Powell, who sets interest rates, this is what he's watching. He's not going to come out and say, I'm against unions. He's not against unions. But if everybody gets a wage increase, then nobody's better off if we're all getting it. The price is just going to go up. Auto workers, we, that's in the news. Um, by the way, auto workers in the United States make $65. That's 90 Canadian, $65 an hour. That's over $100,000. They want, by the way, the problem is UPS making 170, everyone else says, I want that. I want that same settlement. So they're, they want 40%. And General Motors and Ford is already at 25%. And, and it's going to be sought off between 25. This is not, this is not nothing. So again, if everybody makes more wages, you you haven't, inflation ain't going back to two. Just this is a global problem. Australian. Chevron's starting salary, 350000 Australian. Wow. Over, almost 200, over 200 US. Um, so where does this leave us? Okay. 
So we're, they're going to watch strikes. I want to talk about the U.S. saying that they're not going to lower rates because the United States and Jerome Powell and whoever it was, Bernanke and um, even Greenspan, these people try to guide us and they have a terrible track record. I want to remind you where the guidance was in 2021. 2021, the US Fed rates were zero and they said, everyone hang on. I want to assure you that we don't anticipate any rate increases until 2023. And we think by 2023, we will have raised rates to 0.75. Well, now the US is at 5.25. So that was maybe one of the worst forecasts I've ever seen. And one of the reasons they do that is called moral suasion. They wanted to convince everyone that rates were going to stay low forever. And so businesses would go and spend. This is, co this is during COVID. So today, they see these wages and they want to convince everyone that rates are going to stay high. Here's the reality is the economy is going to slow and we're starting to see a leading economic data which says that this is these US will begin to lower rates next year. So if ironically this is a market that will sniff this out. I want to show you so in typical third year of elections you tend to be weak in September and October but November is actually the best month of the third year of the presidential cycle. So we have only a month left of a little bit of pain. And I see the markets up today, who knows what they do next week. At the end of the day, you um, I've showed you the other chart of the years. You, you are gonna see this yield curve normalize. Yield curve normalize means short rates will come down and this will unlock a lot of the capital. Um, so let me uh, go down here. So where are we finding? Now we mentioned that we thought, you know, it's interesting the Nasdaq. Well, why aren't we in tech stocks? Well, tech stocks are have the highest valuation and the most vulnerable. Let's remember the Nasdaq's up 24% this year, but it's still down 12% from where it was uh 2 years ago. So at the end of the day, you know, when you lose 30% and gain 24, you're not, or you lose 33% as it did last year, you're still not a happy camper. And if we look at the S&P 500, we're still stretched in valuation. But if you look at the mid cap index trading about 13 times earnings and about 12 times for small cap, there is, these inverted yield curves are very interesting because they create opportunities. Um, I want to just talk for a second about, you know, the curves and money flows. When a curve is inverted, like we are, and GICs one year from the Royal Bank are paying five and a half percent, that's incredibly enticing. Um, a little story: when I started, I left the bond desk and started uh, my number one pick, and and thank you to my clients that are still with me. Um, and these were Toronto professors and, uh, you know, guy that le now lives in, in Kingston and uh, still with me. But I, I mentioned these people, I think you ought to buy 20 year bonds. Now, when the yield curve is inverted, people just hold cash. 20 year bonds were yielding 11%. But people said, well, why would I do that? I can get one year at 12. When the curve inverts, this is when the greatest opportunities arise because nobody wants to do anything but hold cash. So a, an inverted curve is actually the time to be sniffing out some good fixed income or some low valuation stocks because inverted yield curves throughout the dawn of time only are around three to 5% of the total duration. Yield curve normally means that short rates are below long-term rates. Now, if you're a sports fan in Canada, there's a sports network called TSN. And, and every time there's a, a, a team, the, when the, the Canucks are ahead of the Leafs and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden the, the Leafs turn it around and 
score a bunch of goals or or vice versa. They call it, what's the TSN turning point? What's the, what's the play that turned the momentum? Well, I'm going to talk to you about the math of preferred shares. And TD Bank announces redemption uh, of Series 20 preferred stock. Okay. And we're going to call this in preferred shares a, an interesting TSN turning point. Um, and here's a graph of the TD Bank preferred shares. Now, again, we owned this a while ago. We don't own it today because we sold it near its par value. But it's an interesting turning point because TD Bank's preferred share was a five-year fixed floater. And the yield five years ago was very, very low. And they were going to come up to an anniversary. They have a choice to make. They can call this preferred and get rid of it and pay us $25. And then they're done. Their obligation is done. Or they can pay us a brand new dividend. Now, this time, the dividend was going to be much, much higher than it had been. And the reason I printed up this chart is TD Bank decided that it was better for them to cancel this preferred and give us $25 a share than it was to pay out the five-year bond yield, which is over 4%. They would have had to pay us four and a quarter plus 2.59, so almost 7%. Again, their mortgage rates are six and a half, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to be borrowing on an after-tax basis at close to 7%. So they just said, we're done. We're going to give you all your money back. Now, I have printed out or put on the slide here seven preferred shares, which all come due in 2024, that have a reset rate that is higher than the TD banks just decided, we're out, we're giving you your money back. A, a, a look at Enbridge FA, which trades at incredible um, $14.71. And I'm going to go through a bit of history, and I want you to remember that bond slide. In 2014, Enbridge issued a brand new preferred stock. Now, in 2014, Interest rates were around one and a half percent, maybe two. And Enbridge said, we will pay you 4.4%. Well, I can get only 2% of GIC. I'm I'm smart guy. That's better. So Enbridge, this is the one, Enbridge FA right here. I'll pay you 4.4%. In five years, we have to redo the deal, and the deal would be 2.66% plus the rate. Well, the rate came along, and rates had gone down to 1.4. So the dividend went from 4.4 to 4.1. It was a bit of a blow to people. They got they, So we had five years of 4.4. We had another five years of 4.1. Now, remember the bond issue of the two and three quarter bond trading at 89 cents on the dollar? So bond, preferred shares tend to yield 1% more than GICs. But you can get a GIC in the high fives today, okay? So it makes sense somewhat that Enbridge would, would trade, like that bond's trading down, that Enbridge would trade down because if I'm going to buy Enbridge, I want to get at least 1% more than a GIC. There's some risk. It's very small. Enbridge Incorporated in the 1950s. They run pipelines. It's a toll bridge. They just collect their tolls. In a day, um, I need a, I, we'll, we'll redo the price. Now, if you're a buyer of, uh, if you bought this brand new preferred, 10 years ago, you're sick and tired of it. You paid $25. You're doing the math. At your math, I'm only earning 4.1. And you're tired of looking at it on your screen and you sell it at 1471. I, I will caution you that these preferreds, though, have they're like they have magical powers. Because it's like, you know, Clark Kent is not. A human, he's got magical powers. And the magical power of Enbridge is in 2024, the deal gets redone again. And instead of 
2.66 plus 1.4 paying us 4%, it's going to have to pay us something much, much higher than that. Now, again, the five-year yield is 4.28. If we look at the structure of where the bond market is anticipating today, one-year yields. Now, again, Bank of Canada is a five and a quarter. So the bond market is definitely factoring in rate rises, rate declines. But they're already saying that rates will decline on the five-year basis to 4.20. So I'm doing the math, and I'm going to use four. If Enbridge now the new dividend, the new dividend at 1471, Enbridge is either going to have to decide that they don't want to pay a 7% any longer, they're out, or they're going to have to pay us a huge increase in dividend. So it's going to go from a dollar, it's going to go from a dollar uh, two to somewhere around a dollar 70. That is a huge increase of 70%, and that would put our new yield at 11.3. So the magic is, I want to show you all these preferreds, because I'm hearing some of the questions are, I'm losing on preferreds, I'm down. Well, these are people that are looking at their screen and looking at half the equation. Because if I look at these, I see two-thirds of them are down, and I see I'm down year-to-date minus 2.7. That's just the stock price. So if you're looking at a snapshot on your screen, you have to account for the yields. You've been earning six and a half, and magically in a year, you're going to get a massive raise in your dividend. So one of two things happens. Every single one of these is a more attractive to the buyer, less attractive to the, to the issuer than TD Bank just had the board. They had to sit around. They have a board decision. We're done. Every single one of these preferreds is more attractive than TD Bank, and they're trading at anywhere between 58 and 60 something 70 cents on the dollar um, this is a generational opportunity that only exists because the yield curve is inverted these are people that flooded away from gic's and you you give them five and a half on royal bank and they're out but that is what's creating the opportunity you know i had some clients uh some calls with clients and we're like they're like I, I can't figure out who's selling them. People just get tired of stuff and they're not doing the math and they can't be patient enough to wait till 2024. And I will caution you, there's some that come due in 2025 and the math is even better. It's, they're unbelievable. So rates are much, much higher. The supply and demand of the bond market says rates, rates maybe uh, are priced right. And they're not going to come. The 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 five year, the ten year are actually kind of anchored, and uh, that that creates an incredible opportunity. Um, let's talk about this is all going to merge together. Um, something I've been talking about, but it's it's now it's here. Uh, Toronto home prices fall for the third straight month in August. I will tell you that the September data is horrible, okay? It was kind of, if you can remember, we were down last year in real estate prices and everything picked up. And it's almost like, if you remember Pavlov's dog, when, when you know, ring a bell and the dog will salivate uh, when it's feeding time, Toronto home prices and Vancouver home prices are down. Well, we've learned from 30 years, you buy them. So the sellers, uh, they just said, we're out. It was huge lack of inventory and the bargain quote, bargain hunters that saw prices were down 10% started bidding up prices again. Um, but the, um, show you, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go through a couple of these headlines. Um, why the Bank of Canada pause won't save the housing market this time. And that's because it isn't necessarily just the rates going up. It's how long they stay up. And the problem is that the vast majority, a third of mortgages come due next year. And only about 7 or 8% of mortgages have come due so far. So most people are still sitting on their one and three quarter percent mortgages. If 
But as they all come due, they're all going to be up dramatically. Um, this was a uh, article um, over a month ago, but we mentioned this in one of our calls a while ago. Romson, which is, runs a private mortgage investment corp, so it was paying out 8% for years. They were bragging that they had consistently paid. And then they said, it's all fine, but you, we're going to halt redemptions. You can't have your money uh, just, just for now. Then, since we spoke last and they said, you can't have your money, but don't worry, you're, everything's fine. When Romson froze redemption, mansion, a management cited trouble with loan repayments. Those issues persist. And in a letter to investors justifying the latest distribution cut, Rom, uh, Romson said, July's repayment activity was particularly disappointing. Uh, Romsman told investors in a quarterly report earlier this month that 2023 is proving to be one of the most challenging for the fund since the mid 1990s. I mean, hats off to them for actually saying what is actually happening, but September it's getting worse. So, uh, you know, um, more headlines. Uh, CIBC posts lower third quarter profit as bad loan provisions rise. So what they're doing is taking a provision because they're sensing that people are having trouble paying their mortgages. It's going to get worse. Banks are bracing for bad loans, but the trouble is only getting started. Let's talk about this bad loan provision, because in 2009, the banks put aside this chunk of money because the U.S. financial crisis, they anticipated bad loans, and rates came down, and there weren't any. COVID comes along, and everyone's out of work, and the banks take this chunk of money, and they say, we're going to have some bad loans. And they said, you don't have to pay your mortgage until you go back to work, and we'll give you a mortgage holiday. And the bank's going to send everyone free money anyway. Yeah, there was no problem. Here's the problem today. It's the rates that are the problem. And the problem is, if you had a mortgage under 2%, and now it's 6.5%, we are looking at anywhere from an 80 to 100% rise in your monthly mortgage costs. Um, we talked about... Sorry, this was a screenshot. I do some work at sometimes from my bed when I wake up in the morning. Uh, this is a couple of days ago, and it's gotten even worse. It's um, BC, the total number of listings. So it something I follow, and I'll tell you in the spring, it was 15,000. We're at a record, 29,000 homes um, for sale in British Columbia. We've gone from the realtor saying, you know, there's no supply. There's just, I know things are weak, but there's nothing to buy. Like prices can't go down. It is now oversupplied. And so with very weak buyers, um, you're oversupplied. Um, I won't go jump there. Look, you can talk about immigration all you want, but unless we're going to bring in 1 million immigrants, all with $20 million in their pockets, or 10 million or 2 million. The problem isn't it, it there is a supply and demand problem when you're bringing that many immigrants. The problem is is the prices are so high that people just can't make the payments. It, it was one thing to borrow 1 million dollars at one and a half. But at six and a half, you're at 65,000 just of interest. So principal and interest your, your basic rule of thumb is the same rules of thumb that it used to be. It costs you roughly in property tax and your monthly maintenance on your condo about 1% a month. So if you're borrowing a million, it's 10,000 a month. Okay, if you're borrowing 1.5, it's 15 a month. These are after tax dollars. Um, this is just amusing, but I'm gonna tie it. You remember the president of Turkey fired the central bank and they said, you know what? We're going to lower rates. The economy's suffering and the central bank's an idiot. So they lowered rates because the central bank had raised them to 18. Well, guess what happened? The, the currency collapsed. And now interest rates are 30 in an attempt to defend the collapsing currency. And I bring this up because when an economy goes through any uh, amount of final cri um, uh, crisis, Interest rates tend to go up. 
Now, this is contrary, but the United States is the reserve currency in the world. Anytime they get into a financial crisis, rates go down. It doesn't hold true for the rest. It just certainly didn't hold true for Turkey. And, I, and again, that sounds like an extreme example. But I want to point out, this is a chart of the U.S.-Canada spread. Now, the spread shows the differential in interest rates. And you can see here the green part of the spread shows that in Canada, you get like the United States, you get a yield pickup. So yields are higher than they are in the United States. I want to show you the 09 recession for a brief period. When, when times get into crisis, now COVID got to zero, but interest rates in Canada then picked up. So it wasn't a positive spread to the United States, it was a negative spread. So ca Canadian rates went higher than the United States. And I want to show you what happened in 91, because this is the playbook. We haven't seen mortgage rates go up 80% since 1991. And ironically, we are in a situation, so why, why aren't I as alarmed in the United States? They did away with floating rate mortgages. They don't exist. Uh, they did away with subprime. Every single subprime lender in the United States went bankrupt, all of them. So in the United States, 92% of mortgages are 30-year fixed. So you've got a rate of 3%. That doesn't get reset. You, you, there is no moment where you're out on the street unless you move. So this is why they're not going to move. You're going to stay in your house. But in 1991, when, when, when the crisis began to hit and Canadian recession was much tougher than the United States recession, Global bond buyers, and again, James Carville, I want to come back to the bond market, they demanded 2% more rates than the United States. So the bad news is as we go forward, the data is going to be worse in Canada and the United States. 70% of Canadians have a mortgage. So 70% of, of, of people are going to be paying more. Two thirds of the Canadian economy is consumer spending. So you tell me you, you've got the United States that has the same mortgage payment, nothing changes, or the Canadian one where the mortgage payment's going to go up 80%. Houston, we have a problem. So the Canadian data, it's math. It's going, unless rates collapse tomorrow before the end of the year, the Canadian data is going to be far worse than the United States data. And um, as a result, our interest rates, the playbook, the playbook is that interest rates are going to be 1% to 2% higher than the United States. So in a weird way, the worse the crisis is, the more our rates will be 6.5, which would put mortgages at 8.5. So you do the math at 8.5, you're going to be up 120, 130%. Um, just another example, like Ireland, okay? I'm not, like, forget Turkey, Ireland. Okay, the, the European tiger, everyone was accusing them of cheating because they were the tech hub, but they had a real estate bubble. And when the real estate bubble popped, I just want to show you Ireland interest rates in 2011, when the European crisis happened, the, they could not borrow in the bond market at one or two or three or four. They had to borrow at 12. Didn't last long but the real estate market collapsed and most Irish banks failed. It's not a lie, it's crazy stuff, but this is, this is what's coming. Um, I, I wanna talk, this is important, and I've said it before, but I cannot stress it enough because since we started talking at the end of the year, mortgage rates have gotten worse, the housing supply and demand has gotten worse, and it looks more, more certain that we're going to see some financial institutions fail. I'm seeing from my stuff that comes in more and more investors with $1 million sitting or 300 or some crazy number. You, are, you have deposit insurance of $100,000. By the way, you do not have $100,000 of out-of-province um, uh, credit unions. You have a hundred thousand dollars 
if you buy a million dollars and that institution fails, you are going to to get back one hundred thousand dollars. You know, there was an ad I saw posted for a 6.35 one-year GIC. I say, okay, but it but it required a minimum million dollars. Okay, well, let, let's think about this for a second. If you're willing to put a million dollars unsecured into a, into a financial institution, I just want to show you, First National, okay, one of Canada's biggest alternative banks, um, up and comer, really growing. They just issued three-year bonds, okay, at an average rate of 7.29. So why would you take 6.55 when you can buy the bond, both unsecured, buy those at 7.29? In other words, the GICs are just hooking people in. But So you're getting 2% more than Royal, getting 1% of the GIC, 2% of the bond. Is there a 2% chance that First National is going to go bankrupt? It's much higher than 2%, much, much higher. So um, I put this out again, Canadian credit crisis, read it, do not buy over 100,000. Mortgage investment corps are all going to shut down. Um, these are the banks to avoid investing in. Um, by the way, large Canadian banks vulnerable. I mean, you know, Bank of Nova Scotia and Commerce have lost a third of their value in the last 18 months. You know, looking at uh, CIBC today, and it's at a, other than two weeks during COVID, the stock is trading at the lowest price in seven years. So of the 364 weeks in the last seven years, um, only two, two, two weeks of buyers are happy. Everyone else is is down. And, you know, I pick on CIBC because if you ask mortgage brokers, it's one of the ones that is is most lax in its, um, you know, credits. So they'll take the ones that Royal said no to. Um, so look, at the end of the day, this is coming. Watch out in Canada. Uh, the Canadian dollar will manifest itself in um, currency. It's it's going to devalue because the it's simply if someone can tell me that I'm, my math is wrong, Canadian consumption will go down relative to the United States. Um, certainly on a per capita basis. I mean, you could bring in two million immigrants and just sort of keep it going from slightly more viable, but on per per person basis, spending's going down. Uh, it's going to be very, very tough. Rates are not going back to zero. We have a supply and demand balance on the bond market. Um, remember, during COVID, they printed the money. Um, so I'm happy to discuss with people. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but at the end of the day, the bond market was buying its own bonds back. You can only do that for a short window or you create hyperinflation. We did it for a short window and we've created this inflation already. Um, again, the playbook is. This is a generational opportunity on the preferred shares. Be patient. Um, my math says if if we're running at six percent and we're down two or three, we're still not really getting crushed. Just be patient because we get the reset next year. I mean, we either get reset or we get called. Sonovus, I'll just tell you, Sonovus, who the cattle's largest energy companies has actually said their goal is to eliminate their debt. You know what they did two weeks ago? They bought back all the bonds that they could, yielding more than 6%. Well, Synovus, at face value, their preferred shares will yield over 7 Well, it's more expensive to fund your debt on a preferred share on an after-tax basis than, than the bonds that you can tax right off. So all things being equal, again, the economists, if that was due today, Synovus would actually pay out $25. Every single board of directors is going to sit around a boardroom table and decide whether they're going to cancel these preferreds or pay these much, much higher dividends. So what looks like, hey, you know, I'm only getting six and a half. Why bother? I get five and a half in GICs. These have got superpowers, and the superpowers, the Superman, you go from Clark Kent to Superman in 2024. So not a good idea 
to sell that to buy a GIC because the yield curve normalizes in 2024. So I hope that helps. Um, I'm excited about uh, fixed income and I haven't been excited. And if we want to review accounts, please happy to do it. Appreciate patience this year. It is not, again, we called that the economy would in the United States do far better than people anticipated. It's not that the economy is falling off a cliff in the United States or even in Europe. It's simply the people are pulling. We And, and I, I, I'm sorry for my U.S. guys, a GIC is a guaranteed investment certificate. In the United States, they call them CDs. So you can insert CDs. So you've got a certificate of deposit in the United States paying five and a half or five and three quarters and the same in Canada. And that's taking some people that would own Johnson & Johnson and or ExxonMobil and they're saying, you know what? Just get me out. I'm, I'm going to go with a five-year. By the way, in cash money market, there is a record. Now, that's going to keep going as long as rates stay at five and a half percent. But when the Fed normalizes and the Fed, let's talk about the election cycle. We're going into year four. The Fed has said we're not lowering rates. I'll, I'll call a little bit of BS on that. There remember, there's supposed to be a Chinese wall. The U.S. Fed acts independently. In my 38 years in the business, I do not ever remember the U.S. Fed keeping rates up going into election. They will cut rates um, in the spring or summer because that's what they always do because they don't want to be seen as being political influencer. And they will stop doing whatever they're doing going into the election. So that's where you have it. Um, I'm watching. Energy prices, um, of course, that's going to lead to inflation. By the way, in Canada's inflation rate, oh, it's going to cut rates. Inflation, Christiana Friedland was bragging that Canada had the lowest inflation rate and they were doing the best job. Um, well, inflation went to 2.8, but guess what? It's gone back up to 4. And thank you to Ben Rabidou's homework. Um, that's actually going to stay stubbornly high right through the end of the year due to the baseline effects from a year ago. So we actually could see that tick even higher. There's absolutely no way that interest rates can come down before the end of the year. And the problem is going to be is the tr massive amount of resets that happen next year. And that's going to create uh, something that we haven't seen in a long time, which is you know a bit of foreclosure. As few homeowners, the end of the road is power of sale. That's, this, is, this is what's coming, it's starting to see it now but it will become what much more predominant. And unless you're my age, um, you don't ever, you think this doesn't happen in Canada, but it sure did in the, in the 90s. Real estate lost 30% of its value and six major financial institutions failed. Um, so um, I think that's probably where I should leave it. Um, you know, I don't get excited much and I know it's not that exciting to kind of be flat or make, you know, be flat for the year. But this is setting us up for a tremendous um, going forward because this the cash is on the sidelines, not because things are bad. So when the cash comes off the sidelines, it's going to be really good when the preferreds. Remember our year in 2021 on the preferred shares? This is what we're setting up to do. I'm just warning you. So why would we, these preferreds, even if they don't get called, they're all going to be up a dollar, two dollars. So do the math. If you're up on an eighteen dollar preferred a dollar, you've made five six percent, and then you earning six. Well, that's twelve, and then your dividend <laughs> resets higher. So um, we're looking at double digit returns from here going forward. So be patient. Don't don't jump because look. And if you have new money, I have no problem. I've said this before. I have no problem with um, no problem at all with uh, GICs or cash. And again, I prefer T bills. This is not the time to be chasing risk. Five and a quarter, you know, a quarter percent less in a government T bill where the whole million dollars or two million or or thirteen million is guaranteed uh, is the way to go right now. Um, I think I've answered most of the questions. There were lots of good ones, a lot about preferred shares, a lot about, um, you know, the markets being flat. Um, why aren't we in tech stocks? Well, <laughs> um, valuations are a problem there. 
Uh, just uh, one of the questions that we always get is gold. Um, gold's up only 2% for the year. Again, better than the Dow. Um, and look, gold is being um, manipulated by the same function as preferreds, as the Dow. Hey, the fuel that it was funneling stocks was money that couldn't get a return anywhere. You start to give people 5.5% return, they're going to... You're, you're, you're going to have some people that tap out and just say, give me the five and a half. Same thing's happening with gold. Like gold is losing its enthusiasm when you can get five and a half risk free. But I will tell you the Fed will normalize and gold will take another leg higher. It's highly probable. I've seen this movie before. I also find it quite interesting. Costco is selling gold bars and they're selling out within hours. I mean, I don't know. That doesn't tell you that, uh, you know, maybe people are worried about currencies. It's the most solid currency in the world that can't be printed or devalued. So with all the debt, it's not a bad thing to have a little bit and uh, um, good for Costco. I love it. So uh, with that, thank you, uh, everybody. And I know I've gone way, way over, but lots to cover. Thanks again. 